everybody and welcome to let's look at Kentucky Route Zero. I apologize for kind of the in media res like just starting right in the start of the game here. But there's no other way to kind of launch into this game due to the title screen. But I'm just going to say this is a an adventure game that was actually just released today and it's making a lot of noise because it was uh, actually nominated again earlier today. It's been a big day for these guys. Uh, for a number of IGF awards. IGF is the Indie Game Festival, basically like the Oscars of indie games if you're going to oversimplify. So it was nominated for four awards, Best Art, Best Narrative, Best Audio, as well as the Seamus McNally Grand Prize. So obviously some heavy pedigrees here. And this game, at least for me, basically came out of nowhere. But I picked up the game, again, just released today. Uh, episode 1, it's kind of taking like an episodic Walking Dead style uh, with its distribution, uh, is now available for 7 bucks. And I beat it in one sitting, which only took about an hour. Uh, and I'm going to explain why this is both an intriguing game and a game that a lot of people are going to want to check out, as well as a game that probably is going to anger a lot of people in the comments, but we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So I am playing as uh, this gentleman right here that you can kind of see in silhouette. Obviously, the visual is, visuals in this game are, are very much a strong suit, but we'll talk about that as we move along. Particularly, I mentioned this in the Legend of Dungeon video, but uh, with this game as well, the dynamic lighting is really amazing. But what we can do here is interact with these things. Anything that we can interact with is highlighted, and this is a very non-traditional point-and-click adventure game. Without further ado, let's just get started, though. So we can go look at our dog here, and we can get a description about him. So it's an old dog in a straw hat. We can look at our truck and get a little bit of uh, context, basically, for who we are. Because, again, we're starting in media res, so uh, it's a little bit confusing. Deliberately, or eschewing, you could say. So we work for uh, Lysette's Antiques. And we're just going to go move and talk to this gentleman right here. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, walking animation in a second. But first things first, let's just speak to the gas station attendant at Equus Oils. Alright, so Joseph is telling us about a car wreck. I always struggle with these point and click adventure games. Like, do I read all the text or do I not read all the text? I usually assume that the audience is smart enough and fast enough to read it, but then I speak over top of it. That's probably really distracting. In any case, I will probably just summarize and cliff notes things. So we get our first choice here. Uh, we can basically name our dog. It's either his name is Homer or her name is Blue or just some dog I don't know his name. And this is kind of a good uh, spot to talk about what makes this a non-traditional point and click, click adventure game. When you normally think about point and click adventure games, it's like, okay, I've got a puzzle that is going to have like 10 different steps in order to solve it. Like there's going to be an obvious goal, like we have to shoot the cannonball at the uh, opposing ship, like in the Critter Chronicles. Uh, but in order to do that, I've got to put the piece of gum on the stick, I've got to put the stick down the grate, get the key, use the key to unlock the door, get the cannonball, etc, etc. This is very much not like that. It's like an antithesis of this. So far, at least, in the first episode of Kentucky Route Zero, there's basically no puzzles to solve. Everything that happens is gonna happen. It's more, much more of a narrative or a set story uh, than basically any point, point and click adventure game I've ever played before in my entire life. What you do is you kind of fill in the gaps. Like, you create the story as you move along. Not so much by creating the actual events that happen, so to speak, uh, but by filling in the characters. So we can basically choose whether we want our dog's name to be Blue, whether we want it to be Male, uh, or whether we just want it to be some nameless dog. But these choices become more and more weighty, not in the sense that they actually have an effect on the gameplay, but in the sense that they have an effect on the characters and the story being told. So we're going to say his name is Homer for now. And Joseph is going to remark that our dog Homer is pretty old. There's really good dialogue in this game, by the way. It's really kind of... I don't know, it just seems like friendly. Everyone seems to have like an intimate relation to themselves, or to everyone else. Uh, so we're going to get our first kind of puzzle in a second, but first we've got to establish kind of what is happening in the game so far. Don't worry, there will be some actual non-dialogue based gameplay shortly. Uh, so we're going to establish our character. I've been driving all evening looking for five Dogwood Drive, and this is kind of set the stage for what our overall goal is going to be for the rest of the episode here. I'm not going to play through the whole episode, uh, because the entire episode is about an hour long. And I don't want to spoil the entire thing, because really, part of the joy of this game is actually experiencing it for yourself. Uh, so we're going to say, so where is Dogwood Drive? Joseph says, listen, you and Homer would have been driving up and down the 65 all night. Dogwood Drive is on the other side of, well, to get there, you've got to take the zero. So, again, Kentucky Route Zero, as you might expect. All right, you can use my computer to look up directions, but you'll have to head down into the basement first and reset the circuit breaker. I'll be happy to have those whining lights back up anyway. It is too damn quiet out here. Well, not with you yapping like that, Joseph. Uh, so he's going to give us a lantern, and again, this is what I was talking about. Whenever a game knows that it's got good dynamic lighting, they always give you a lantern. So one thing I find really uh, neat about this game is the aesthetics, of course, as I've already mentioned. You can see, like, the swinging lamp, that's a nice touch. But also, like, when you just click on something, it's not just, like, an X that appears on the ground. It's, like, a horseshoe marker, and then the horseshoe rattles against it. Just a neat little touch like that. Also, the, uh, sound design in this game is absolutely fantastic. Like, keep in mind, as you're listening to this, like, the rumbling in the truck in the background that's persistent, the crickets... I don't know, it just does a very good job setting the scene for what we are dealing with here. And again, notice the beautiful 
dynamic lighting. I also like how all the elements that you have to interact with are very clear, but I must stress again that if you're looking for a traditional point-and-click adventure game, uh, this is not for you, but there are, you know, dozens of games that are for you if you're interested in that kind of thing. So we're gonna go over here and take a look at these basement people, maybe do some dialogue here, and then we're gonna try to solve this quote-unquote puzzle where we're gonna have to deal with the circuit breaker. So we're clearing our throat. Okay, so we can say, have y'all seen a circuit or a breaker box down here or sorry? Didn't know there was anyone down here. Let's say, sorry, didn't know there was anyone down here. And then these guys are going to have their own conversation, basically, uh, indicating that they're playing some kind of game where they need a D20. Not to spoil the surprise, 20-sided uh, dice. But in any case, this, is, this conversation is really good to read uh, as I am talking here, because it does a good job of introducing one of the central themes of Kentucky Route Zero, which is kind of like the ethereal or the otherworldly. There's a lot of stuff in this game uh, to do with, with ghosts or potentially spirits, uh, and... Oftentimes when you're interacting with people, you're never really sure whether they're really there, and you'll get a feel for what I mean as we move a little bit further and further along here. So you might have seen in the flavor text there, as we move down here, uh, that they indicated they've lost a D6. Well, the secret to this puzzle, this is really the only puzzle in the entire first episode, in my opinion anyway. Uh, these are just the rules here, so no consumption of beer or spirits on the premises. I wonder if that's a pun now that I think about it. Beer or spirits. Get it? Ghostbusters. Bustin' makes me feel good. I'm sorry to ruin the atmosphere like that. Uh, so they might have mentioned, if you talk to them more, that the D20 glows in the dark. So what we can do is turn off our lantern, and all of a sudden, the game piece is just illuminated down here. So we can pick this up and inspect it. The number five is facing up. It's just a small piece of plastic, but it has a reassuring, almost comforting weight. He places the object in his jacket pocket. Turn our lantern back on, and we can come back up here. As far as I know, there's no way to get around this uh, puzzle here. It's essential for both the story and the, uh, you know, the actual flavor of the game, if you will. So now, the basement people are actually gone, and this is what I mean when I say that the nature of people in this game is very transient. So we have two choices here. We can either place the 20-sided die on the table or keep the 20-sided die in our pocket and walk away. We are going to put the 20-sided die on the table. Who knows? Maybe this is like some Solera Vastora stuff, and he's saying, you know, the... Dimensions between our worlds are connecting. Maybe he can use that and uh, engage in some jolly cooperation, D20 style. But we're just going to turn on the circuit breaker here and watch as Equus Oils lights up around us. So we are going to climb back up to the top here. And we will get our first kind of introduction to the overworld of this game very shortly. Because not all of it takes place just on the Equus Oils uh, campus here, basically. There's four or five acts in this game. Notice the music as well. We're going to see some more awesome music a little bit later, but uh, the music is used sparsely, but very, very well. It makes it more powerful when it actually does show up. So I'm going to go back and talk to Joseph here. It looks like my dog is uh, defecating, which you know. You know how dogs is. Let's see what Joseph has to say here. There it is. Just listen to those lights whine. Well, I'd better get those directions and head to the zero if you don't mind. Or there were some people down in your basement playing some kind of game. Uh, normally in this game, I like to kind of flesh it out and, and go through all the flavor text options. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I'm going to try to take a little bit more of a direct approach here just to see if it'll go a little bit faster because I don't want to spoil the story. Really, if you want to play this, you want to get into the ambiance uh, yourself. So I want to leave a lot of those options open for people who are interested in it. So the computer's in the office. You're looking for Marquez. She knows her way around these roads. She'll get you to the zero. The password is, ah, uh, damn, I usually just feel it out. Muscle memory, you know? Uh, I do know... But I also think it's pretty terrible that you have absolutely no idea what your password is. But it's kind of long, kind of like a short poem, I think. One of those short, short poems that really sums it all up. You'll figure it out. And this is probably the best example of what I was referring to earlier when I mentioned that there are, you know, if you're going to talk about it in an abstract sense, there are puzzles in the game. But the puzzles don't really have a solution. Or rather, the puzzles, everything is a solution to the puzzle, if that makes any sense. You choose how the puzzle gets solved. It's really unique in that way. Some people will probably call it pretentious, uh, but I think it's uh, kind of unique. So we can type Conway. I'm going to spoil it for you. Typing Conway doesn't actually give you anything. We're going to type Joseph because that is his name. And then we get to choose our password. So remember, it's kind of like a short poem. Again, to spoil it for you, the what we choose, I believe, doesn't matter. All we have to do is uh, create a poem for ourselves. So why don't we take wheels... Oh, the stars drop away. I clicked on the wrong one by accident. So the, how about the stars drop away, the moon throbs, the lights whine, and the cow says moo. Password accepted! Alright, so Joseph has reassured us that we can figure it all out. And again, you know what? Actually, I'm going to check out games. I checked out messages before, and there's some really interesting messages that kind of add some more, again, backstory or context to this Joseph fellow that we're dealing with. Uh, the address book is where we'll accomplish our objective, but let's check out games. I've never seen that before. Games is not real. Alright, that's interesting within the context of the game. 
itself. Uh, it's interesting because this is not really a game. This is much more of a uh, interactive story or a visual novel, if you will. So we're going to go to the address book. We could choose the address of the Zero, of Dogwood Drive, or of Marquez. He told us to go to Marquez, so I'm going to go to the Marquez residence. And we're going to get some kind of interesting directions here. So head northeast on the 65, turn left as soon as you see the ugly tree that is always on fire. Look for the barn at the base of the mountain there. Can't miss it. All right. So it's out there on Macondo somewhere, right? Yeah, that's it. All right, so we loaded that old TV of mine into the truck. I borrowed that thing from Weaver Marquez a number of years ago, and now the power is all weird over there. And I can't pick up anything but static and public access anyway. Blah, blah, blah. She's more of a reader. Again, I'm not blah, 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 because I think the dialogue is, uh, you know, overly verbose or anything like that. I just don't want to actually read it all myself and, again, spoil it, because this is the whole reason you'll be playing this game, is for the dialogue and the kind of... Uh, it's the kind of, it reminds me a little bit of a game like Train Simulator. It's like, it's difficult to explain why you would like it, but if you like it, you know you like it, if that makes any sense. So this is another unique part of Kentucky Route, route or Route Zero, I guess, depending on your dialect. Uh, this is kind of like our world map screen. This is how we interact with things. So we can go back to our um, guidebook here in the bottom, but I don't need to. This actually contains our directions, should I want to uh, check those out, but we don't need to check those out right now because I remember the directions. It just said head northeast on the 65, so we're just clicking here, as you can see by the horseshoe. And there's the burning tree. So let's uh, go back to that burning tree. Oh, I botched it here. We're gonna come across all sorts of landmarks here. The jerk, uh, the truck jerks towards the shoulder, not the jerk trucks towards the shoulder. Uh, nearly run off the road by a swarm of dragonflies. Their wings beat briefly in the headlights and disappear into the night. Alright, let's check out the burning tree now. A tall black oak burns on a hill above the road. And that's it. But we know that the Marquez residence is down here. So let's go to the Marquez farmhouse. And it will load us in here. And we'll have uh, Act 1, Scene 2. So that's about the... It's a fairly appropriate length, if, if I may say so. Or a fairly representative length uh, compared to the length of the acts that we're going to come across. Or sorry, the, act, the length of the scenes that we're going to come across in this game. Usually, they're about 10 to 15 minutes each, uh, depending on how much time you personally want to spend. If you just want to rush through it and uh, accomplish the objectives as soon as possible, I'm sure you can do it a little faster. The main thing in this game is that if you want to get maximum enjoyment out of it, uh, you absolutely want to... I guess I should go over here. You absolutely want to check out as much of it as possible. So there is a graveyard over here. But there is also uh, a house. So we're just going to go into the house where we will probably see Marquez again. That graveyard contains a certain amount of flavor text that changes based on your interaction with the person inside of this house as we speak. Sorry about that, guys. There was actually a weird glitch. Uh, I'm using two monitors here, and I accidentally clicked, like, off this one because it runs in borderless window and on the other one. Uh, so I've got it defaulted back to one monitor, and we're going to get started here again. Where was I? We were, if I remember correctly, just going into the house. And what I was going to mention as we went into the house is watch how the aesthetics change. Again, uh, very dynamic visuals on this game, which I enjoy a, a great deal. Just definitely you can tell that a lot of care uh, went into this. But in any case, we're going to meet a new character as we open up in here. And you kind of get, like, a close-up look at the graphics, which is nice. So now we are meeting a new character called Weaver. Uh, and again, I'd like to point out how weird it is that when the characters interact with you in this game. Like, we just walked in, we have no context for this person, we've never met them, and she's just, like, instantly, like, popping us into a conversation. It's, it's very non-traditional, and I, I like it a lot, actually. Uh, again, uh, I didn't see any owl, I guess. And I'm kind of just waiting for her. We're gonna, our main objective here, again, if we're talking about this from a puzzle standpoint, is we got to put the TV in here. Uh, and, and get it fixed as well. So she asked us, what do we do for work? Is it too difficult or do you like it very much? I was once a mathematician. Are you looking for something in particular here? Well, you got too many questions there, lady. Um, I'm looking for the zero is the answer there. The old blind man sent us. Is that right? Of course he did. We never knew he was blind until now. Uh, he said you were too smart to watch TV. But he did also ask us to return this TV set of yours. So we're going to set it up for her first. And then she is going to explain for us. Uh, what we are supposed to do in order to get to the zero again It's gonna seem at first like this game is basically just fetch quest after fetch quest where they are just gonna give you like You do something for them and then they're like, okay Here's how you go to the zero and then you go to that location and that doesn't end up being the actual route to the zero and you decide Oh, well, it's just a wild goose chase from beginning to end. That is not what the game is about This game is very much about the journey not the destination if we are going to say that at least episode one again I can't speak for episodes uh, two through five All right, so that's not how it's supposed to look You've made a mistake setting it up. Is it a foreign object to you? Which of your parents was it who wouldn't allow you to watch television? Uh, my mom thought she heard ghosts in the static. 
And then Weaver is going to suggest that she is mentally ill, kind of distant, fearful. Again, this is the way the player kind of has agency. It's not in a traditional gameplay sense. It's more like uh, you kind of fill in the gaps with your character. So we're basically creating Conway as we go. It's kind of an interesting way of thinking about things. So fearful, yeah, it's a certain way to put it. And she's going to malign us for not paying attention. And tell us to look closely at the television, which of course, we're going to click on the TV and then immediately look past it to this sweet-ass barn behind it with a couple of horses. And we'll get some more flavor text about that. Momentarily. I guess we have to click on the barn first. Again, she's maligning us for not paying attention to the TV. Uh, let's say, what do you keep out in that barn? Used to be tools and feed, then books. Now I think it's mostly spiders. This is where Spelunky starts, I guess. And now Weaver is going to tell us that her cousin Shannon would know more about TVs. She fixes them for a living. And we are going to uh, go see her, I guess. But Weaver is going to first tell us we shouldn't even bother with the Zero. She wants us to go to uh, see her cousin instead. So it's pretty easy. Get back on the 65 heading north and take your first right after the artificial limb factory. From there, your arrival at the Zero is basically inevitable. And she leaves us with a very vague hint. Keep your eyes open, especially in the dark. Well, that is why I have the lantern, isn't it, Weaver? And then, as in keeping with the theme of the game, uh, like interactions with people being 100% transient, never being 100% sure uh, of what can be real and what cannot be real. By the way, I really like this animation right here is like a set piece, I feel, of, of this first episode. Which is why I was a little bit hesitant to show it off, but also uh, excited to show, uh, show it off in its own way. Because it's one of the animations that makes this a special episode. In a weird way, it's kind of like Loom, if that makes sense. If you remember Loom, it, that was like that papercraft point-and-click adventure game. Uh, this is a game that is very much as much about the aesthetic as it is about the actual experience of playing the quote-unquote game itself. So I'm going to end the episode very shortly, but first things first, we are going to make our way back to the truck here. And we're going to appreciate, uh, we're going to come across a very surprising moment here, which is one of the reasons why uh, I found Kentucky Route Zero so special the first time I played it through. So as we make our way down here, we're actually going to get treated to kind of an impromptu bluegrass song that just kind of adds to the atmosphere here. And this is where I'm going to stop the episode. What's kind of neat about this, though, is we could just get in the truck and drive away and these guys would soundtrack things for us. Uh, but when I first got here, I was, like, really in the mood of the game, so I just listened to the whole song. And they just played through the entire song, and then, like, they faded out, stopped playing, and then the screen zoomed in on my guy again. Uh, almost as if they expected a lot of players to just watch through the entire song. I think it's really cool. Anyway, this is Kentucky Route Zero. I'm going to appreciate appreciate these guys for giving me a backing soundtrack for the outro of the game here. Let's talk about the negatives, the things that people are going to be pissed off about. This is not a game, it's a visual novel. Normally I do not like visual novels, but there's not much gameplay to speak of here. This game does a very good job of creating atmosphere and ambiance, and I had a great time. I think one hour was the perfect length of time. The sore spot for a lot of people is going to be the fact that this is a fairly pricey game. It basically adopts the same model as Telltale's The Walking Dead game, so the first episode is going to be 7 bucks, or it is 7 bucks, I guess, that's what I paid for it. But you can all buy all five episodes for 25 bucks right now, although only one episode is out. So I know a lot of people are going to say, you know, 25 bucks for five hours of gameplay, uh, is not very good, but it's actually, uh, the way I think of it, if it stays consistent, and if all the episodes actually do end up coming out, uh, it's actually just $25 for a great story. And as it is right now, $7 for uh, a preview of what that story could potentially be sits all right with me, but I'm totally understandable, or I totally understand, rather, I should say, uh, if not everybody is into that sort of thing. There's definitely better, if you're looking at it from a pure value as, like, price versus gameplay perspective, this game is not going to be up your alley. But if you're into games like, you know, The Dream Machine, if you're into games like... Loom, uh, this is gonna be something that's very interesting. Best comparison I can make? Imagine if Telltale's The Walking Dead was, you know, half as long and had no combat and no puzzles. That's essentially what I've been dealing with so far. Very unique game. Uh, I think a lot of its nominations in the IGF are well deserved and I'm looking forward to seeing future updates. Uh, but for now, this is something that's gonna appeal to some people and probably not appeal to a lot of people for better or for worse. But either way, I give this a thumbs up. I'm really interested to see how this works. Apparently I've been talking for a long time because you just witnessed that special moment that I came across holistically. But in any case, thank you guys for watching, and I will see you next time.